London, and hello, Rebellious Media Conference. This is Douglas Rushkoff. I'm a media theorist, author, and uh, I suppose now I'd be considered an activist. Um, coming to you actually from Springfield, Missouri, a place I didn't know existed until I got here, where um, one of several thousand, actually, uh, um, Occupation Wall Street-like events are occurring simultaneously uh, across America. Uh, uh. Why is the internet under threat? And how does this threat manifest? Why is the internet under threat? The net, um, the greatest threat to the net is our own um, ignorance of how it works, our own refusal to, um, to engage with its possibilities. I mean, uh, you know, we live, we live in a world that has been, uh, uh, you know, highly indoctrinated into um, 20th century narratives and values. You know, it's a, it's the shape that we're used to. We are from, even though we don't read, we're from a book culture that understands things in terms of beginnings, middles, and endings. We don't understand sustainability. We don't understand open-endedness. We don't understand how to maintain paradox and confusion. You know, even on the left, we look at someone and say, oh, well, that activist is carrying an Apple iPhone, so he must be stupid. Forget him. We dismiss it. Rather than we live in a world where we have to be able to actually maintain opposites, maintain contradictions, keep alive and discussing and working through. You know, the thing that's been interesting me over the last few weeks is how you know, both the left and the right and the mainstream media uh, have been so uh, flummoxed and perplexed by the, uh, uh, the current wave of protests. I mean, they were fine to do it when it was going on in some Arab country. It's little brown people speaking against some dictator. They can kind of go with that. But when it's happening here... And when they talk to the to the so-called rebels and they can't get a clear story from these people, they can't get that 20-second explanation of, what's your problem, what do you want us to do, here's your camera time, um, that's because this is, not, this is not necessarily compatible with camera time, with broadcast media, with broadcast media, which is basically a marketing tool. You know, broadcast media, which is an artifact of mass marketing and mass production. Broadcast media, which came about not because anyone had any idea to share, but because brands needed a way to put their images and faces into towns before the plain brown boxes with their picture stamped on them got there. Right. So to expect that tool to be able to do this job doesn't make sense. But if you look at the difference, say, between... A debate on uh, look at the difference between a debate on television about these kinds of protests and the debate that you might see happening in a Twitter feed. Um, the Twitter feed debate is more nuanced. It's more developed, and it's more willing to approach this as a problem that's going to require uh, a coalescence and a collaborative process rather than a problem for which we want to grab onto quick answers. You know, the, the, the problem for those of us who lived in the 20th century um, is we are used to movements with charismatic leaders. We, we are used to this, this uh, a modified ends justify the means fight to get the thing we want. And we're no longer there. That's not really a net era um, approach to the world's problems. And I'm not talking about styles of interaction here. I'm talking about something actually bigger, that in the, in the, in the 21st century, we have learned that the isms don't really work, that these giant narratives of, of sort of global, um, uh, uh, global universal appeal, none of them work because there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to maintaining culture. That's the way the industrial age looks at things. We are in a bottom-up, multifaceted, many cultural uh, uh, universe now, and we're going to come up with lots of different solutions that can coexist simultaneously. But how has the internet actually? How how has the internet changed this? How has the internet created this? Yeah, you know, what what is it about the internet that's that's made this fundamental change? Um, it's 
it's really, it's looking at, 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 the way to understand the internet is to look at the difference. Look at the difference between the internet and what uh, Marshall McLuhan described as the global village back in the 1960s. What McLuhan was talking about was not the net. McLuhan's global village was really the global satellite connected broadcast universe, the globe. And, and when he used the term global village, he was almost being sarcastic, as if to say, globalism, you know, that this is the dream of, of, of the sort of statecraft, this sort of global thing, the Stuart Brand's picture of the earth from afar, and satellites connecting us all so we can all watch the same episode of the same program at the same time. But that would be the global village. It would be an oversimplification. The internet, and particularly uh, social media on the internet, has turned out not to be globalist. Social media has turned out to be extremely local, extremely nationalist. You know, Arab Spring was not about, oh, we want to join the global community. Arab Spring was about, we want our place to work. It was nationalist. They're waving their flags. Um, that's that's the way um, this kind of uh, handheld, bottom-up media works. But and the, it, yeah. but the internet isn't actually like that, is it? Facebook and Twitter aren't those institutions. They they they're, they are globalizing. Yeah, Facebook is a globalizing institution. Um, not. I mean, were you on the the Sir, Are you on the Syrian language Facebook page for the protests there and how right. to organize? No. You know, no, we're sitting and, and chatting about it, and look what happened. I mean, their problem ended up becoming a very different problem in the United States. Operation, you know, Occupy Wall Street is very different than Bring Down Mubarak, right? It's it's our problem. That's not their problem. That's not Africa's problem. I mean, we create problems for them, but this is our problem we're dealing with, and it's it's specific. Um, it's specific to our communities and to our uh, our nation, not to others. Okay, um, I'm just trying to, because um, I'm trying to um, ask a question about you know, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys on the internet? That we use. So Facebook, for example. Facebook is biased towards marketing and oversimplification. It's biased towards delivering users unto the paying uh, uh, researchers. I mean, we're not the users of Facebook. We are the product of Facebook. Um, at the same time, it's so widespread, it's proliferated so widely, it's so seemingly non-threatening to so many different places that it's a great tool for activists. You know, it actually does work. Um, so it's both, you know, so it's both. Black box, you know, internet, you know, encryption technologies, anonymous and all these things. I mean, they're great and they're powerful and they prevent all sorts of things from happening and they're a great check and balance on certain kinds of things. But they're also out of control, and they end up attacking. They end up attacking good people and and doing terrible things too. I mean, because they're they're not quite regulated by. They're not quite a self-regulated body yet. Um, they're not necessarily making all of their choices in the most uh, uh, collaborative way. Partly because they're seeing. I mean, there's good and bad. Um, so I don't think it's a matter of identifying the good guys and the bad guys. I think it's a matter of building the culture we want. I also, I honestly do believe, as I look at Occupy Wall Street, and however much I appreciate what they're doing, and am, am determined to translate what they're doing to a mainstream media that cannot, I'm trying to, to, to communicate what they're doing to a mainstream media that, that's predisposed to not understand it, um, I can't help but feel the age of protests and movements itself is over that it's just time to start living the way that we understand we have to live. You know, if the world is about to get totally fucked up, or if there's a way to solve the world's problems, my approach would be the same. Right? What we need to do is to develop um, local peer-to-peer -peer communities through which we can exchange value and create value for one another without using borrowed currencies, without using the banks, without needing to purchase and employ ourselves and outsource everything to corporations. So the solution for apocalypse and the solution for apocalypse are the same thing, right? It's a matter of getting invested in one another, reducing our dependence on highly centralized corporate structures, not killing them, just reducing our dependence on them, still going to buy your iPhone from a corporation, but buy your Swiss chard from a local farmer. I mean, it's not that complex. It's just a matter of, of actually doing it, you know, and, and protesting, 
well, it's fine. I don't see Wall Street having an answer. I don't see Wall Street ever um, intentionally um, uh, uh, deconstructing the algorithms they're using to destroy our culture. All we can do is be less dependent on their long, super long supply chains of commodities in order to live our lives. So, you know, you, you've got a conference in New York, it's transforming society, education and sustainability business. You, can you outline some, some of these forces of transformation that are going on? Well, I think there are opportunities. Um, I think there's, there's an opportunity for us to transform almost any system we're living in. I just feel like um, over the last 10 years or so, the net got over-commercialized and people started to understand the net as a business story. And that's not what it is. If anything, it's kind of an anti-business story or, or maybe pro-commerce, but it's kind of anti-business um, as usual. It doesn't depend on large amounts of central capital. So it's a whole new digital commons. Right. I mean, there's a lot of other things. So you know, I'm interested in the impact of the net on, on education, on culture, on uh, the way we create meaning and understand ourselves as human beings, the way it changes our relationship to government and, uh, and information. I mean, we may finally have a tool through which people can enact something like democracy. Right. So far, people have proven too stupid. Right. You know, Ed, Ed Bernays and, and Walter Lippmann were correct in that, you know, people are too dumb to do democracy in the midst of a spectacle. We might finally have a tool through which we can educate ourselves enough to participate in this thing. Um, so I'm just looking at people uh, and supporting people who are pushing on that, mm -hmm. who see that opportunity of the net rather than using the net to just continue and exacerbate the problems of uh, 20th century uh, industrialization. Second, a lot of people are talking about the sort of holes in funding models, you know, that, that everyone's creating these new structures, but there's no way to sustain them. I was just talking to um, the guy who runs Couchsurfing, and, you know, he's, he's looking for new funding models to run Couchsurfing. He sold it for seven million, I think, to some venture capitalists. You know, is that the only option, or are, are there other ways yeah. of funding these digital futures? Digital futures? So a lot of them can fund themselves. I mean, I, I think if... if the community can't kind of support the thing, then the thing has to be reconfigured. I mean, how do you support a uh, local currency? You know, I mean, in a way it doesn't make, I don't understand it. You support it by doing it. You know, community supported agriculture. How do you fund it? By people doing it. You know, how do you support a let system? By being willing to accept favors and no favors. You know, that's, that's how you do it. The, the whole idea that you borrow money from a bank in order to invest in a thing, I mean, that's artificial. That was a created scheme in order to increase our dependency on central treasuries. And when they made peer-to-peer -peer currencies illegal in the 11th and 12th century, I mean, that's what we're looking at. So it's easy. I mean, this is what people, they, this is what they learned how to do in the late Middle Ages and what we're going to relearn now. Identify a problem that you want to address identify something that you have a solution for and then use the net to find the others you know to find the others who you can who you can do this with the net what the net helped us do in in a in a media saturated media addicted world the net helped us liberate ourselves from top down programming um and then allowed us to look at the real world and see all the other ways in which we were being programmed, in which we were submitting to uh, operating systems beyond our own control and were, that were not devised in order to help us get things done. Um, that's the lesson of the net. 